Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, give this talk. So, um, I will be telling you about some ongoing research in understanding ADS specific to techniques. And since I understand that while some people are really expert about this topic, some people are unfamiliar with it, I decided to give maybe a more introductory talk. And I apologize to the experts, uh, but I would encourage anybody to stop at any time. If anything is not clear, I really aim to be pedagogical. And uh, uh, if people want to discuss the detail, uh, I'm very happy to discuss afterwards. And I should also add that there will be some interesting uh, new results and some ongoing work that I might be able to just mention, but uh, I'm very happy to discuss it more uh, after the talk. So, the subtitle of this talk I decided is Computing the Spectrum of Free Strings and Beyond. Computing the Spectrum of Free Strings is a very well defined uh, problem for some fixed background. And the beyond part is something related to computing three point functions, four point functions, and so on. I might mention that if there is the time, but for most of the talk, I will be talking about computing string spectra on essentially ADS3 background and why this is an interesting problem. So let me just tell you something about string spectra that you certainly know, but just to set the stage, an example of, of string spectrum that you know is uh, the spectrum of strings of fast space. Probably one of the first calculations that we tend to do in a string theory course. And what we find is that the spectrum is pretty simple. It's very degenerate. The energy of a state depends only on the total uh, number of uh, oscillators and not of the oscillators of the individual fields. And it's simple, it can be written in close form. Another spectrum that we know very well is the spectrum of three strings on ADS5 process 5. That's maybe not very intuitive on the ADS side of the duality, but if we use it, the ADS duality, we can think of it as the spectrum of anomalous dimensions of n equal four superior mills. And for that, we have, I think, a good intuition from the superior mills. So from the ADS5 process 5, exploiting the n equal four superior mills duality and looking at local single three superators in n equal four superior mills, we find that the spectrum is in general non degenerate, meaning that, of course, states form multiplets of the symmetry algebra of the theory, which is PSU 2, 2 slash 4. But other than that, as soon as you introduce a coupling in an equal force of pyramids, all the degeneracy of the free theory tends to lift. And it's quite int intricate, meaning that it cannot be expressed in closed form, and we don't even know how to write in closed form the spectrum of a given state. If you pick your favorite state, the most famous being maybe the Konishi state, people will be able to give you maybe a 10 loop answer for the dimension of the state or some numerical value, but they cannot really tell you a closed formula for the finite coupling, uh, finite of coupling dimension of the state. It's quite complicated here. I don't want to go that much into the complications, but one thing is that, for instance, when you expand order by order, you get higher and higher transcendentality coefficients and so forth, so on and so forth. So these are two, example, two, two examples of, of spectra. Now I want to have a look at ADS3 CFT2. And my point is that ADS3 CFT2 has a little bit of both of these features. So the first thing that I should state is that, for instance, in equal force of means we have one parameter, the toast coupling, which is the string tension. If you're looking at free strings, that's all that we have, we are with all that we have in the spectrum. For ADS3, and let me take a biggest particular background just to be concrete, which is perhaps the simplest. ADS3 process 3 cross T4. We have at least two important parameters 
for the spectrum. We actually have more, but if you are a bit cavalier and maybe we don't look at closely things like binding and momentum on this T4, at the very least, we have two interesting parameters for the spectrum. One is the overall tension. Of the string, and two is the ratio of Ramon Ramon versus an SMS background classes. Indeed, this particular background can be realized as a near horizon limit of a D1 D5 system that would give you a background with only the amount of fluxes, or it can be realized as a near horizon limit of a system of fundamental strings and MS5 breaks. And that would give you the background with only an SNS fluxes. But you can also do something in between, and then you would get a combination of them. So now I just want to tell you without really telling you how they were computed, but I want to give you a little bit of a flavor of some of the features of this background, starting from the two extremal cases, and then the in-between will be, of course, slightly more complicated. So, if you have only an SNS fluxes, the string theory can be understood as a resume of victim model with a non-compact group, so it's a, it's a little bit tricky, but still, the spectrum, I would say, that is simple is still very degenerate. And in fact, the short string spectrum is very similar to the spectrum of strings in flat space, qualitatively at least, and also as A long string continuum. Which is not something that you have, for instance, in ADS5. So this looks like something very simple. Despite being very simple, actually, only I would say rather recently we started understanding all the finer details of this background, and in particular. We started to understand something about the dual theories to these backgrounds in a more precise sense than was before was done before. And it is work, of course, by among other Lawrence. Now introducing the more amount flux. What we expect is that the degeneracy is leaf. The genesis lift immediately, even if we do just a small perturbation. And the continuum disappears. And other than the fact that, in principle, you can obtain these mixed flux backgrounds by starting from the Vesuvian model and perturbing it in some way, or starting from the Dwarfsif theory and and the perturbing that in some way, not much is known. But qualitatively, we would expect the, the same level of complication if you have a finite distance away from the an SNS point, the same, the same level of richness of the spectrum as in an equal for superior mean. So you would expect very, very non trivial spectrum that you cannot probably write in close form. And the most extreme case is when you have only a one or and this would be probably very similar, we expect. Of course, qualitative. Now, the question is now how we can hope to study this setup for any value of these parameters. So for the SNS point, for the Ramon amount, and for everything in between. And a very nice statement, that is already a few years old by Kanyat and Zarembo is that as a classical 
linear sigma model. This setup is integrable. And SNS, Ramon Ramon, anything between is classically an integrable field theory. And now the question is can we use this integrability promoted to the quantum level in some sense to compute the spectrum? Are there any questions up to this point? Okay, if not, let me try to raise the blackboard and go on. Well, I have a trivial question. Yes, please. If you want to use the integrability, the question almost answers itself, but I'll finish anyway. If you want to use the integrability for the string theory, I guess the conserved charges of the integrability have to be conformally invariant so that they make sense for the string theory spectrum. So uh, what we will do is a bit different because we will study this theory in light form gauge. And that will actually, I mean, I agree that in principle, the, the, the charges we will be able to express in, in any gauge, but in light form gauge, we will have some advantages that I'm going to describe in a moment. Okay. And probably answer one worry that you might have had, but let's, let's, uh, let's get there. As anticipated in the answer to that, but we want to use light from gauge. And one reason is that, and it's very simple, it's very clear definition in light from gauge. In light from gauge, we say that time on the worksheet is related to some coordinate in time and space. Let's say some combination of time in ADS3, and maybe some angle of SN. And that's very helpful because integrability is a property of this two dimensional theory on the worksheet of the stream. And what we can hope to compute is something like the spectrum of this two dimensional model. What we are after is actually the spectrum of the energy operator in ADS, which is related to this target space co coordinate. So light on gauge does this neat thing for us of relating these two, di these two directions and therefore relating the Hamiltonian on the worksheet to the energy in tar target space, which is really the eigenvalue of some SL2 generator. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that we can work in light on gauge With an S matrix, at least in principle. And it is well known for integrable theories at the quantum level that, in a sense, the S matrix can be a much better object than, let's say, the quantum Hamiltonian. The S matrix, and I will tell you in a moment, actually behaves quite nicely. And light from gauge is good because it really, well, of course, at the price of losing some nice symmetry properties, but it gets rid of a lot of spurious degrees of freedom of your theory. And the S matrix is nicer if you only have to worry about scattering physical stuff. And then the picture that we have, the cartoon really, is that we have our pretty propagating string, which is a cylinder, ideally. That's our, our string. And in principle, we would like to think, and this is not precise, that we have some, some excitations that make up our string state here. And the excitations, they do something. For instance, they might scatter. And we want to study this sort of setup. This setup, as it is drawn, is not correct because it's a cylinder. But as long as we can open up this cylinder, Then we are really talking about a two dimensional field theory in infinite volume, which could very well have an ISS matrix. Now, of course, how to go from here to here requires some limit. You have to take the, the limit of this, uh, the, the radius of this cylinder to be large. That's also something that you can make sense of in life on gauge because you can relate that to the R charge of some geodesic that you're using to construct your state. 
So the aim of the game in the integrability approach will be to really think that we have a two-dimensional integrable quantum field theory defined on this plane, find all the properties of this theory, starting from the S matrix, and then worry later about how to glue it back and put it back into finite volume. And there are techniques for that that are to under the name of thermodynamic beta answers or mirror thermodynamic beta answers. So uh, your two dimensions is not the space at infinity, or is it? Sorry? Is your cylinder the boundary of ADS space? Or no, is it no, 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 no. It's, it's the worship of the string. It's the worship of the string. Yeah, uh, you would have the same thing if you were in any ADS, ADS5, ADS4. Yeah. The fact that you can relate the size of the string, so the periodicity of sigma to the, uh, let's say, R charge of some reference state is also a, a consequence of light convergence. I would not want to go uh, to get into now. Now, with this framework in mind, now we make an assumption. And I really want to start stress this as an assumption that the model is quantum integrable. So we know that it is classically integrable. That does not necessarily mean that it is quantum integrable, but let me assume it. And then following basically an idea that uh, zamological and zamological put forward for relativistic uh, theories like sine Gordon and so on. Um, the idea is that let's see what this means. And what it means is that the first thing is that this picture is a two-level objective, but it's actually the correct picture because normally what you would have is that two particles come together. And in general, you could expect a bunch of particles coming out. But this is not true macroscopically. So macroscopically, we have only two that go in two, and the scattering is elastic, meaning that the momenta here in and out are the same. And another consequence of this is that if I now have three particles, one, p two, and p three. Well, they come together, they interact, they do something very complicated, but they come out and we still have P3, P2, and P1. Not only that, but I can undo this scattering and represent it as a sequence of two particles. Where, for instance, In this case, in this picture, I would have that one and two scatter first. Remember, my time is flowing upwards. And then I scatter one with three, and then I scatter three with two. Now, there are, of course, actually two ways of doing this decomposition. And by consistency of this picture, they have to be equal. This equality as a famous name is the young baxter equation. Okay? Why is all this true? Is because we are thinking that there are very many conserved charges in this theory that allow me to relate all these, in principle, different objects. Now, what is the advantage of all this? The advantage is that if I manage to nail down the two body as matrix, then I know everything about the theory in infinite volume, and I only have to worry about putting it back into finite volume because I know any scattering event. So then my goal becomes fixing the light cone, or rather the S matrix on the worksheet in light cone gauge. I should stress this the S matrix on the worksheet, on this one plus one dimensional worksheet. It represents excitations on the string. It has nothing to do with strings scattered. The string is free. Oh, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, how does this worship S matrix depend on the choice of the gauge? Is it something that you know how it transforms or? Yes. So uh, let me, uh, so uh, there are different ways of fixing light cone gauge and I don't want to get that much into detail, but um, I had to choose a light cone coordinates. You can do this in many ways. You want to do the way that they be preserved most as possible, but 
you can do it in several ways, and it is known that they will give you different as matrices that change by some prefactor, which is well understood, and that, in fact is very closely related to the type of CDD factor that you get into the bar the form theories. That's for that. If you said, uh, well, I want to do this in another, in a completely different gauge, like in a conformal gauge, well, then I would have a problem because I really want to have a nice, uh, if possible, massive theory, anyway, a theory where I can this, this introduce asymptotic states. And for this, like, on gauge is really the, the chance to move. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right. So now our next goal is to try to fix the S matrix. And it turns out that, of course, you could go and compute it perturbatively, three level on the worksheet, one loop on the worksheet. It becomes very complicated very soon. But it turns out that you can actually fix it almost entirely by symmetry. So just one thing. So what does this matrix scatter? This is matrix scatters the eight bosons and eight fermions of the strings in light cage. You have a bunch of fields. You are, you are going to expand your interacting Lagrangian. If you start with some free Lagrangian for eight bosons and eight fermions, it will have classical vertices, and you will go on and on and get an interacting theory for all these particles. And we want to fix it by symmetry. Can I ask before you go on, just, just to clarify? Yes. If I just have the infinitely extended string, just sort of sitting out like a cosmic string or something, like, but really, uh, mm -hmm. are we just talking about the, uh, the, just the scattering of the transverse excitations of that, of that string? Is there any- Those are the transverse modes of the strings that, are, that we are scattering, yeah. So that scattering up that you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Literally what I said would be like X zero equals T gauge or something. But they yeah. don't make any difference. Yeah. It's pretty much the same thing. This, the choice that I made is a bit nicer. It preserves more symmetry. So it makes my life easier, but that's all. Yeah. But it's the same amplitude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Long extended string. No, it's, it's not extended, right? The string is, is small. Ah, sorry. That may be a misunderstood. Oh, no, I'm sorry. So this is a short string. This is a short string. Is it a short string or a long string? It's a short string. Sorry. Maybe I misunderstood. It's a short. So this, this is a short string. Sorry. I, I, that was my I misunderstood point. the question. Thank you, Juan. The short string uh, is expanded around some point like string that is moving into ADS and around the sphere. And it's sort of like small excitations around this, this solution. But yeah, what I didn't quite get, it, it is anyway a, 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 an expansion of the transverse fields in this line from gauge. But for the short string. In fact, you will see in a moment, well, maybe later we'll see that. I missed the first five minutes of the talk. So maybe ah, all right, okay. No, no, sorry, but uh, I. Uh, can you just I just understood your question. I apologize for, for stopping, but can you say one more time what's the solution you're expanding around? Sorry. So, uh, in a solution uh, where the string, so I'm expanding around the solution where uh, at the same time the string is, is point like, is moving around, around time in ADS linearly and linearly around some great circle on the sphere. So, okay. we are in some ADS process. Okay. Thank you. Something that might help is that in this gauge, the density of momentum is constant on the world. Yes, gauge. absolutely. Yeah, I didn't want to get to that yeah, anyway. <laughs> but yeah, that's true. Yeah. So these are called the also uniform light on gauge because of this reason. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what I wanted to give uh, to give is a little bit of a flavor of the symmetry. And uh, let me just remind you that we start with the symmetry algebra, which has PSU one comma one plus two plus PSU one comma one slash two. So this part contains an SL2 and then SU2. This part contains an SL2 and an SU2. Together, they give you the bosonic isometries of ADS3 cross S3. Uh, there is also some, some symmetry, some new ones that have to do with the T4, but I will be a little bit cavalier about the T4 part. And this algebra has actually eight real supercharges. So here we have, let's say, L0 and L plus minus 1. This is SL2. We have J3 and J plus minus, that's SL2. And then we have four supersymmetry for Qs and four superconformal charges for Ss. And the same thing here, only that I call them L tilde, J tilde, Q tilde, and S tilde. 
Uh, this split uh, is, well, is reminiscent of the fact that the dual will be a two dimensional uh, uh, conformal field here. So this is alpha of the supersymmetry of radius five for people that are keeping count. And by the choice of the light from the the light from Hamiltonian is right, it's really the Hamiltonian on the worship. So maybe I'll call it, I don't know, let me call it E worship is the, the energy of a mode on the worship. It is L0 plus L0 tilde, and that's really the energy in ADS3 minus J3 minus J3 tilde. And the nice result of this choice is that this thing is actually semi positive definite, and it is zero precisely on the BPS, on how BPS is. And you see immediately that if you want something that has the symmetry, that is symmetric with respect to this choice of equation, is symmetric with this operator here. You immediately lose all the non abelian part of S2 and SL2. You just are left with a cartan, and it turns out that you're also left with only half of the supercharges. So I, I want to write down the algebra, which is probably the only uh, detailed result that I will give. So we require that any charge, any charge that is in this. Light cone gauge commutes with this guy. And what I find is that I'm left with two Qs, which I call QA, and two S's, and P. Satisfy this very simple relation, and there I also use the PPS condition, and I have a similar condition for the for the right guys. So far, it's very unsurprising, maybe even boring. What is a bit surprising? Is that if I go and compute the QQ tilde anti commutator, that is not necessarily zero, but is given by some central extension C. And if I do the same thing for S and S tilde, That's not zero, but it's given by some other charge, C bar. Actually, they will be conjugated to each other, but if I impose that this is a real representation. So this is an extension that relates this copy to this copy. And it's the same type of extension that Weiser, uh, uh, for instance, found in ADS5 process 5. And in fact, it was found even earlier by Gavin and I by studying the near degree limit of this uh, ADS3 process 3 setup. So what you find about this extension, you, you can find it by semi-classical calculation on the orbit of the string. And you find that it's related on a one particle state in light from gauge on the momentum of that one excitation. So C acting on a, let's say a part a state that contains N excitations. So this is some state with where I've excited N fields of these state models and experiments. I created a uh, operator says and the daggers, and I gave them some momentum. And this thing is proportional to some number. And it has this very particular form.
And this number here is proportional to the strength of the Ramon Ramon flux. So this extension is not there at all when you are doing the Vesumino-Vitte model. But when you have a, even a little bit of Ramon Ramon flux, you will get this particular expression here. And even more, you see that it's a bit funny because these lines all look like something that is additive in the momentum. So if I do it for P1 and I do it for P2, and then I try to create a state with P1 and P2, well, it's not the sum of the two charges. Another way of saying is that this algebra is realized with some non-trivial coproduct. So going from the one particle state to the two particle states requires some non-trivial coproduct. That's also similar to what happens in AGS5. And long story short, this makes the structure of this algebra very, very constrained. In particular, one thing that we find is that these particles, these eight plus eight particles, they don't transform in any representation of this algebra, or in any random representation of this algebra, but on some very special representation. And in particular, it's transforming short representation of, of that algebra. And the short representation satisfies a constraint, which is that H, H tilde is equal to CC bar on the representation. Now, H plus H tilde, you see it from there, is actually equal to the energy of the state. H minus H tilde is actually some quantized object because you see we're taking the difference of these two terms in that L minus L zero, that's a spin, is just some number. And same thing for J3 minus J3 tilde. And C and C bar, well, it was given there. So out of this, we can find just out of symmetry, the energy on the worship of a state of momentum field. And I will first write it, write it and then tell you some comments about it. So this parameter we already encountered is related to the Ramon Ramon flux. This K here is actually quantized, is related to the NSMS flux, and more precisely to the Vesumino written level of this theory, if I didn't have any Ramon Ramon flux. And this thing here, mu. It distinguishes different particles. So I can compute it perturbatively, for instance, and it's actually a quantized number. It turns out that I could take a S3 cross S3, and if I take Mosul and S3 on S3, I would find that mu is, is let's say, one or minus one. If I look at modes on T4, it, I would have mu equals zero. And then it turns out that for consistency of the theory, you have to say that mu can be any integer. So one thing that you find basically is that you started with eight bosons and eight fermions. By consistency, you will have to construct bound states of these particles that will have any value of this mu. And you will have to, have to consider all this volume of the particle and to construct the S matrix for all of those. Very luckily, because of this symmetry, the S matrix is almost entirely determined just by demanding that the S matrix, whatever it is, commutes with any generator of the touch. What is not fixed is an overall prefactor, which goes under the name of dressing factor. And that is really where this program that was started many years ago got stuck, so to say. So the problem with these dressing factors is that there are constraints like unitarity and crossing symmetry that can help us find them, but these constraints by themselves are not necessarily enough to fix them. 
So one thing that I've been looking at recently is uh, new ways or a new proposal for these lasting factors. And I think that now we have found something very nice, which not only satisfies all the constraints, but has nice properties when you try, for instance, to consider this bound state and put together all the particles of your theory in a single object, in a single space. Now, from here, there is a more or less well-defined route that one can take once you have this dispersion, once you have the S matrix, to put the theory back into finite volume, and this is called the table and arithmetic answers. I don't want to discuss this in detail necessarily now. I just want to tell you that there is the technology to do this. I maybe will tell you that it's called thermodynamic with the answers because it relies on actually looking at the theory in finite temperature rather than the volume. So sometimes people call it mirror thermodynamic with the answers because you have to introduce a model where you swapped space and time. Uh, so this is not something that I want to comment on that much. I would rather comment a little bit more on the features, on the qualitative feature of this dispersion because they tell us something nice about the qualitative features of the theory. And that will be the bulk of what I wanted to tell you. Maybe I will make some more comments on like other directions. But that will be about. So are there any questions in the meantime? I should also say that, yes, this, uh, because we have these parameters k and h, all this story that I've been telling you about fixing the S matrix and so on, it really goes through for any theory with arbitrary ratio of this Ramon Ramon than an S and S plus. It also goes through at a very special point where you only have an S and S flux, and in particular at that point, you see that the dispersion becomes extremely simple. Here you only have massless particles that move at the speed of light, which are not relativistic because they are shifted by this thing, which is like a background gauge field on the worksheet. But still, it's a very simple theory. And the S matrix actually also becomes very simple, it can be written in closed form. Proportional to the identity, which normally it absolutely isn't. Normally, this part, this S, this S matrix reshuffle the flavors of the, of the particles in a complicated way with a pre factor which depends on the velocities of these two particles. And this, maybe I will just write it since it's so nice. Just believe in the moment up to some normalization. And you see that these two particles are moving head on, it gives you some non trivial scattering. There is also the other setup in which they're sort of moving in the opposite direction. That's not physical, it's just something that you get from unitarity. If they are moving in the same direction, since they go at the same velocity, they never catch up, and there is no scattering. And that's enough to reproduce the spectrum model, the Zominovite model, including all the slightly stranger features of this SF2 Zominovite model. In particular, the fact that you have the shift by mu here, remember, mu was an integer, is really what gives you the spectrally flawed sectors of the Vesuvian model, again, for the experts. And the fact that in some cases you can have that for momentum non zero, you can have zero energy contribution. That corresponds to the fact that you can have a, zero, a continuum of strings in this particular theory and in this. Now, this structure is immediately broken as soon as I put a little bit of H flux there. Well, that name, 
H is the normal flux here. Because you see that this dispersion is no, no longer uh, is no longer chiral if you want, but it becomes the usual square root. And for a monomon only, it's something very similar to radius phi. The only difference with radius phi is that mu can be zero. And that's a little bit uh, subtle because now you are trying to scatter some massive excitations or some gap excitations, some gapless excitations, and even perturbative. It is a little bit tricky. You will get IR divergence all over the place, and that also is for a long time some issues in understanding this theory, which I think now we are resolving. So the idea is to put use to the, this to get a machinery that will give you the spectral. It will allow me to start from, for instance, a state in the basal middle model and turn on the Ramon Ramon flux and see how the spectrum evolves, or just maybe study this Ramon Ramon theory, compute the spectrum, and expand it as small tension, which should correspond to whatever is the uh, CFT dual of that theory, which is still to be understood, to be, to be fair. So that's all that I wanted to say, really. Uh, maybe I will comment. I will just say that there is another story about using these techniques or variation of this technique to compute three point function and four point function. It was initiated by Basso, Comazzo, and Viera. And it's something that in ADS5 seems to work fairly well. It doesn't work as well as for the spectrum. But it's very interesting to try to apply this theory, for instance, at this pretty particular point, the NSNS point, where the structure becomes so simple and so nice. And we should be able to do very explicit calculation and compare them with CFT calculations on the motion. So I think that this is really the overview that I wanted to give. Uh, but please uh, uh, ask questions. I think there might be some time for questions. So uh, I'm very happy to make this interactive. Thank you. Yes. Um, so uh, you, you have now a conjecture for this phase factor. That's right. Talking. Yeah. And what tests have been done, and how confident uh, should we be? Uh, I would say I'm pretty confident uh, because essentially um, these dressing factors they have very nice properties under fusion, and they allow you to write down uh, TDA equations, uh, which we did. And uh, these thermodynamic answers equations is in a sense straightforward to write that, write them down, but they only make sense and they only can be simplified if some very non trivial relations and analytic properties of these phases hold. And this is something that we are actually seeing now that uh, there are some non trivial checks between phases that correspond to massive and massless particles. Put together, they have nice properties. And uh, they also have nice properties when you analytically continue them to the regions where this middle theory is defined. So this seems uh, very compelling to us. They are all uh, uh, checks based on symmetries and analyticity. They are not checks based on uh, com comparison with perturbative calculations because we believe that the existing perturbative calculations have not accounted in the correct way for uh, infrared divergences due to these massless modes. So it would be necessary now to go and remake this perturbative calculation, being a little bit more careful about the infrared divergences. And you have a prediction of what they should find. Is there a like, spectrum of a short operator? A prediction of? Yeah. So have you calculated something that? Not yet. No, we have the ground state TDA equations. So uh, maybe for everybody, you first write a TDA equation for the ground state, then you have to analytically continue them in order to uh, construct the equation for the excited states. So that's a technical thing, but it does take time. And the other thing is that we wouldn't be sure what to compare it with. I mean, of course, in the Ramon Ramon case, I'm, I'm speaking now. So, uh, in uh, starting from the SNS and perturbing, I guess you could you can follow the perturbation theory. Yeah. But uh, just the pure Ramon Ramon, which is the case that now we understand best, it's not completely clear what to could, could, we, could we take, uh, let's say, K equal to one, which uh, Lawrence understands, and then ask, uh, add a little bit either Ramon Ramon or. Yeah, so in principle, we are not quite there yet, but uh, well, I think 
also probably k greater than one is also understood pretty well, I would say. Well, on the level of the spectrum, of course, there's no. Right. The level of the spectrum, I say. So I think we, we could, in principle, do that. But now our our focus has been on the pure amorphous mon mostly. Uh, we have to. So for the pure amorphous mon, if you want, we understand the the phases and the TBA equation for the mixed flux. We understand the phases, but we have not checked the TBA equation yet. So it's still something that needs to be done a little bit more, uh, a little bit more carefully. But uh, yeah, I think it's. Uh, I'm very, I'm much more confident that I used to be because uh, uh, the previous proposal from the for addressing factors was just uh, the analytic properties were not self consistent, if you want. Yes? You said you, you know the model is classically integrable. Yes. And you assumed it was quantum integrable. Can you talk about that assumption? What are the process? Is there a process for proving it? So uh, what you could do, I guess, is to do calculations on the worship perturbative and see whether, for instance, at one loop, uh, something comes out that spoils the integrability of the model. It is not very easy, especially because of the infrared divergences. And even in uh, your run of the mill relativistic the one plus one dimensional theory, it's a little bit subtle because it might be fine, but up to adding some counter terms. So this analysis, I wouldn't say has been done that much here. What has been done on the other hand is to construct this S matrix and the fact that the algebra allows you to find an object that is, uh, that satisfies the Young-Baxter equation that has all the properties that you want. So maybe I should, I, I have not said it, but this S matrix that we find actually satisfies the Young-Baxter equation and reduces to the three level S matrix. That's an, an indication that it can be integrable. How exactly this integrability at the quantum level should you know, manifest itself with the same perturbation theory, how to quantize the model if you want? That's, I think, a fairly difficult question that has not been addressed. Maybe as a further comment in ATS5 process 5, most of part of the approach was also to just use this as a machinery to compute numbers. And then, as one was asking, just compare these numbers with, uh, let's say, uh, some perturbative calculation in unequal force of the amidst there. Where of course, it's very nice. That's a very nice theory for these calculations. And then, you know, if that thing works at three loops, four loops, five loops, then you, you think that, okay, it's probably fine. Here, we have a little bit less control, uh, especially on the dual. Are the i and the perturbative calculations, are they all, uh, what, what, what's the nature? What, 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 sorry? what kind of IR differences are there? Are, are they logarithmic? So uh, <clears throat> the first thing that I should say is that uh, the theory that you have on the worksheet is not a relativistic invariant theory. That already creates some, uh, some subtlety. And even when you don't have IR divergences, it's not immediately obvious how to regulate the divergences, meaning uh, if you do the calculation, let's say in ATS5 process 5, where it's well understood, then what you find is that if you use just straightforward dimensional regularization, you get a finite result that is not compatible with the symmetries of integrability. If you use some other regularization scheme that was uh, uh, concocted a little bit by Rao Van Zeitlin, uh, Wolf, and Sundin, then for ADS5 process five, it seems that you can get a result which is both finite and uh, compatible with the symmetry of integrability. Now, here, what you have is that essentially at small momentum when mu equals zero, some propagators here become infrared divergences, divergent, and you can have basically bubbles. You have quartic vertices in this theory that couple massive and massless guys, so as well as massless guys to themselves. And these guys end up in your bubbles and they make everything both IR and UV divergent. What's the nature of the divergence? Is it, is it power divergence, just like rhythmic divergence? You can have both. You can add both, you yeah. can add linear and log. And one, I have not really looked at more than one. Well, there aren't enough derivatives to 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 No, it's not, uh, yeah, it's not obvious. So that's something that we were, we started looking at with Ophi, but uh, yeah, we have to, uh, to look a bit more at it.
you perhaps comment on uh, like wh why it is that the dispersion relation is periodic in the, in the term that comes with the RR flux, but it's linear in the term of the NSNS flux. So what, what's the, so it seems like on the level, the RR flux term is more like a spin chain and with the NS, NS flux is more like a continuous bridge. Yes. Is there any sort of physical? So I don't have, a, uh, it's a very good point, and I don't have a fundamental understanding of this fact. I can tell you that at the technical level, the way why you get this periodicity in the uh, Ramon Ramon flux part is that because of the presence of the Ramon Ramon flux, when you do the calculation in like gauge, you get a term which depends on the boundary condition of some field, which is what ends up being the, the, this momentum, and this term appears as some exponential because it's really the U1 charge of some field that you use to rescale uh, some, some, some generator. So it's really some e to the i phi where phi is some field because you need to basically rescale things to make them uncharged before fixing light gauge. So that's at the technical level how it comes out. What I would like to stress is that what you say is, that is correct, but on the other hand here, there is a bit of a funny structure by which when you shift p by two pi, you can trade that by a shift of mu. So uh, I have to say, I don't understand entirely the, uh, why this happens. It comes out from perturbative calculation is the only thing that is consistent with essentially fusion properties, meaning the fact that you want to be able to take two particles of mass mu one, mu two, and make a bound state of particle of mass with mass mu one plus mu two, and nothing else would have made sense that you can easily see by the presentation theory. But the deep uh, reason for that uh, is uh, is not clear to me. And it's, it's one of the things that indeed I, I would be very excited to really understand at the fundamental level. I believe that to understand it at the fundamental level, we need to understand at the fundamental level a dual integrable model description, not a dual CFT, but a dual spin chain like description. Or maybe it's not a spin chain, maybe it's something, you know, some other quantum mechanical integrable model. But uh, yeah, I think we are not there yet, but it's certainly one of the things that I find very interesting. I wouldn't want to detain you much longer. And maybe people that have questions can just ask them privately and let that be a time. Unless people from online, of course, have questions. Any questions from the online audience? Okay, then no further questions. Let's thank Cassandra again.